that's the thing that I'll, I'll say here is like the difference between culture of Boston, New York, LA, and the Bay Area is that the, the Bay Area likes to think about big ideas and they'll, they'll give you a chance. And I, and I, I really appreciate that. Welcome to Uptech Report. This is our Founders Journey series. Uptech Report is sponsored by TerraLeap. Learn how to leverage the power of video at terraleap.io. I'm joined by my guest, Jerry Ting. This is part two of our discussion. Definitely go back and listen to part one, where Jerry's talking about uh, their uh, platform, Evisort, which is an AI-powered contract management uh, uh, solution, helping enterprise and mid-market companies manage all that awesome data. And it truly is an AI solution and it's some fascinating discussions. Listen to part one again to understand the difference and maybe even some regulation that you want to have around it. Um, but I want to dig a little bit more into your journey, Jerry. Uh, you said um, on the first part that you started as a lawyer and you didn't even want to start a business. So like, I want to dig into that story a bit more. Like, How did, it be, how did the, that step by step, you met your partner and then you're just like, all right, let's, let's start a business. Like, Let's go find some funding. Like, what was that process? Yeah, so I, I started my business actually with one of my clients. I, I was a lawyer and he was a data scientist. And the idea was, hey, I'm spending a lot of time as a lawyer manually looking through documents, manually reviewing documents. Is there a way to use AI to help me understand the data inside of contracts? So th that was it in a nutshell, right? And, and what happened was I actually, it, it's funny, the first part that I'll start with is how to find a co-founder. And I think that that's actually, you know, funding is, in my opinion, an output of the model where there are a lot of inputs, right? Funding is one of the later steps. And so if I, if I can, I would like to start with how, we, how I got a co-founder because without a co-founder, you're just a crazy person with an idea, right? And so you need, you need one other crazy like person that. to make it, a, make it a team. Two crazy people makes, two, makes two, it a two, two crazies make it a team. So <laughs> um, for me, I actually was nervous, right? Because he was my client and he was high profile at MIT and so, I emailed him and I said, hey, look, um, I'm just curious. Right? I, I'm just a curious guy. I think there's a big problem here, but I don't know if the technology exists. I, I don't know if it's technically possible uh, to fix this. Would you, would you mind grabbing coffee if you know the answer? I don't, I don't know if you do, but if you do, uh, would you mind grabbing coffee 30 minutes and let's just kind of trade notes? He was actually um, finishing his graduate degree at MIT at the time. It was finals week. And so I, I nearly didn't get him. This, this could have, Everson could have never existed. <laughs> he gave me 30 minutes. He, he showed up to the coffee shop in Harvard Square and uh, we, we talked for like an hour. And we talked about what exactly is the pain? You know, what am I seeing in the market? What are people doing today? What, what are the challenges that just really make no sense? Lawyers sitting there late at night reading contracts, hundreds of pages. Uh, manually looking for words and looking for patterns. And I think that that's, a, that's the place that I'll start on the founder journey, Alex, is how do you get one other crazy person to believe in your idea? And they see the problem and they, they and a buy-in from it. And a buy-in. And I, I think that that was what got us started was I was able to tell him very succinctly, here's the problem. Here's the current solutions. Uh, here's the market opportunity. I, I told him the lawyers can charge $800 an hour and he said, wow, that's a lot of money, right? And so, you know, so if you if you do something, is it is it worth it? Is the payoff there? Mm -hmm. um, and then do you like each other? And, and I what, think that- For that you guys, was it an instant connection? Was it just like, oh yeah, th this just jived? No, it, it, I mean, I didn't know them very well. I, I was his client. I, mean, I, I was his lawyer, I'm sorry. He was my client. So we were very professional with each other uh, the entire, um, the entire, uh, relationship leading up to that to that meeting, but I walked away from that meeting, saying, "There's like a little bit of more energy in my life. If something's happening, right? I, I don't know if it's real or not real. It's kind of like when you join a new sports group and you're saying, "Hey, maybe I'm making new friends." Right? There's a little bit of excitement in the air, and I remember texting him afterwards and saying, "Hey, good meeting you." Right? And then what I thought was, "Okay, well, he's halfway in. So for us to commit to doing something, by the way, I wasn't all the way in. I I didn't know if it was worth it. Right? So." I started doing research. I started Googling. I started calling mentors. I started interviewing my prospects. What year was this that, that that discussion first happened? 2016. Okay. Yeah, that's the year we started the company. Um, and five years went by seemingly in a blink of an eye, actually. But um, it, it felt like yesterday. And 
how quick was the process from you had the idea, you met with him to, all right, let's start a company. Was it like a week, a month, a year? That's the common thing that people don't, uh, people don't understand really about starting companies is that there's, there's not a, there's not a switch. You, you, when you're, when you're starting a startup, it, you're yeah. just kind of like hanging out. You're doing research together. You're starting spending more time together. It's a, it's actually a, quite a, a beautiful thing because it's very natural, right? Both of us were in school. You know, I was in law school. He was getting his graduate degree at MIT. And for us, like we both really didn't have time. And we found ourselves getting dinner together. Uh, we found ourselves Googling and doing research and sending each other emails at you know, 11 o'clock, one o'clock. Hey, have, have you thought about this? You know, what do you think about this? And it just started, it was like a snowball that picked up steam, right? And it became a snowman. And so when we really quote unquote became a real company was when we filed our corporate charter uh, with the state of Delaware. That's when we, we've been working together for months already at that time. We called, I think a hundred prospective clients and we said, wow, if we actually get a client, um, we don't have a bank account. We should, we should probably become a company. That, that, that's, a, that, that's when we became Wait, a company. You were actually calling and finding clients before you actually had a, had a company in existence. We did. we did. I used to be a salesperson. <laughs> and so I said, hey, let's not write a single line of code. Right? Let, let's not like waste time writing code if no one wants to buy it. And I, I think that's a thing for a lot of founders who, especially like us, were technical in nature. The idea is like, let me just go build it. Let me go build it. Can I build it? What's the best code that we can use? Are we using um, deep learning models? Are we using, like, you can naturally go down that rabbit hole. But the question that I urge every founder to ask or every entrepreneur to ask before you start a business is if we can do it, will somebody pay for it? Because right? if no one wants to pay for it, then, then you're working on a science project. Uh, and that's great if it's fun for you, but it's, it's a hobby. It's not a business. Yeah. Now, fast forward, you, you realize, wow, there, there's interest. You're like, let's start a bank account. When did the funding come in and how did you make that happen? Yeah, when I started fundraising, we had uh, only a small number of clients. And it, it was still very much in the, what do we want to build it phase? We, we had some basic things built out. Clients were using it, but it was, it was a prototype, to be candid. Um, and so fundraising is difficult when, when you, so for me, I don't, I don't come from a venture capital or uh, technology background, right? I was, I was going to be a lawyer. I didn't know anybody. And so for me, it was figuring out, hey, what are VCs? You know, what do they do? What do they look for in a company? Uh, and then for me, it was, I started cold outreaching to, to VCs. And that never works. Uh, if, you're, if you're emailing a VC, then you're probably not going to get a meeting. What I didn't start doing was figuring out who's in my network. Can I ask for one referrals? And luckily enough, I, I knew a couple of people who were um, former entrepreneurs that, you know, have retired or have sold their business. And I, and I went to them and I said, hey, do you, do you know any, any investors? And it was by basically calling on my network, begging them for intros, where I remember we got three intros and two said no, one said yes. And we went to meet with that person and I just kept banging on doors. And then we, we eventually met with, I think, about 10 uh, 10 VCs, uh, and we got uh, three term sheets. So that's a pretty high uh, conversion uh, or, or ratio, uh, but it, it was a lot of hard work. And I traveled between, so we we're out in Boston. I flew to the Bay Area a couple of times and was able to get my first uh, uh, first term sheet out of the Bay Area. And um, that's the thing that I'll, I'll say here is like the difference between culture of Boston, New York, LA, and the Bay Area is that the, the Bay Area likes to think about big ideas and they'll they give you a chance. And I, and I, I really appreciate that. From, from that hard effort and work, you got those term sheets, you start rolling, building the team from there. Uh, that's probably the next endeavor. You've got, you got the other crazy person who decided to be your, your co-founder and get things rolling, but to build out a team. Um, first off, actually, how, how big is the team today? We're just about a hundred people. Wow. So a hundred people going yeah. from two to a hundred what would you say is the biggest lesson learned that you could share uh, advice? Uh, hiring is probably the most important thing uh, you can do as a founder. And I think this is where I see founders go awry when they get to sort of the growth stage of a business is you see them just try to work harder. 
right? The, the people who start companies, they're not normal people, right? Uh, they're people who work exceptionally hard. Um, they, uh, they have a outweighed sense of optimism and they're probably very capable or else they, they wouldn't start a business. Um, and so I see a lot of founders and, I, and I'm now investing actually into other companies. And so I, I actually help other founders. Um, they get to about 20 people and they're still acting like they were a two person company. And th that's when they start to struggle is when uh, they try to do everything themselves. And so for me, the big learning was how do you hire people that are the best at what they do, where it's not you teaching them, but them teaching you, right? And then how do you build trust with that person and then eventually delegate and give them the responsibilities that you once had. For me, when we first started, I was a salesperson. I was the marketing person. I did the website. I, my, my cell phone number was the, the call us number on the website was my cell phone, right? It, it, it really, it, it was a one-stop shop. And then my co-founder was writing code and I had another co-founder. There's three of us. And he, you know, he was uh, the glue. He was between product and sales and operations. He was sort of the, the glue behind me doing sales and my co-founder building technology. But when we got bigger, what we had to do was I, I told my team, every six months, you should be firing yourself in one way or another. And I think that that was a philosophy that really helped us scale and helps us continue to scale today is I still have to remind myself, Jerry, I know you like doing this, but you can't do that anymore. You, you have to let the five people you hire do that because one, they're better than you. And two, you should be doing other things. Right? And, and the role changes every six months. And so the reason why I say fire yourself in some capacity every six months is if you're still doing the same thing you were doing six months ago, your company's not growing very quickly. Uh, and, and that's probably okay for the first year or two year, but that's not what I mean when I say venture-backed uh, startup. Uh, a venture-backed startup, we went from you know the two people to the hundred people. Uh, really, our, our growth was in the last two and a half to three years. The first two years was R&D. It was, can we build the tech? Can we prove it out? Do we have product market fit, right? But when we, when we started selling in the early uh, uh, months of 2019, that's when we actually had a lot of growth. And so I actually hired a lot of people uh, through COVID. Right. And so for me, I'm still going through a lot of this change a lot now. What have you uh, realized is the best area for you to focus on and have kept as far as not given that job away yet? It's fundraising because uh, you can't outsource that as a CEO. Uh, it's recruiting executive talent and it's working with your biggest customers and your most strategic partners. Those four areas I would do until I'm no longer working here, which is hopefully a very long time uh, from now. Um, and let, let me explain why. I think those four roles are actually the same role. Th those four roles, you're the chief salesperson. You're either selling the company to a candidate, to a partner, a customer, or an investor. But I'm actually saying the same thing. I'm talking about the one-year vision, the three-year vision, the five-year vision. I'm talking about our culture and what it means to work here and be a, a part of our journey, whether you're a partner who, you know, the thing I learned also is that partners basically become an extension uh, of your team. And so my, my team is talking to them every week and we're, we're training notes, we're working together, we're working on deals, supporting customers. Uh, and customers, they have to buy in to your vision, right? You're, you're a small company, you're growing quickly, but you're still a small company. A customer is taking some level of risk by giving you a chance. They need to know that they're part of something bigger than just a piece of software, right? And, and investors, I mean, that, that sort of pulls everything together is, you know, why give you an investment for, for a company where they could be investing in 100 other companies? So for me, as a, as a CEO, I think my role is to be the chief uh, evangelist, to be talking about all aspects of the business, whether it's finance or upcoming products or um, branding you know, and position. How do we compare against competitors? And all of that rolls into the CEO office. Because salesperson to all the different individuals, your internal folks, your partnerships, and and for for fundraising. Um, speaking of sales and and marketing, uh, over the past, you said it was like 2019. That's when you started to really see growth. Is there any um, sales or marketing campaigns or efforts that you saw really shine? Tactics that really worked um, that you could share and say, yeah, this is something that works really well. Particularly when I guess it comes to enterprise or mid market um, organizations. Yeah, um, before COVID, it was different. You go to conferences, you meet people. Uh, shake hands, you do it the Missouri way. 
Uh, I remember before COVID, we would go to conferences and then people would say, I don't believe your tech works. And I said, okay, that's cool. Um, well, I have a laptop and I have a, I have a phone. Uh, I can tether my phone and get Wi-Fi to my laptop. Let's upload something right now. And I remember I did that for an SVP of a Fortune 500 company. Uh, and she said, well, and, and she, was, she, she, was, uh, she was a tough, she was a tough person. She said, let me go find it. Let me go find a derby contract. And so she had a team of 10 people with her. She said, somebody send the dirtiest contract you have to Jerry. And, and they were saying, well, how do we find that? She says, and she, she had a deal from last week. She said, send that deal's contract to Jerry. And I said, oh, okay. What, what am I going to get here in my inbox? Um, and it was, a, it was a long contract. You know, it was over 100 pages, scanned, um, many different versions of it. And I remember sitting there uh, at, the, at the booth and I uploaded the contract and she pushed me aside actually and, and, and sat in front of my computer and she manually read every data point that we pulled out. And she had her team, she asked them, is the party name that? Is the expression? And the team knows because they just negotiated a deal. So they don't right, make the right. contract. They, they literally were the authors of the contract. And that's how we got our first large client uh, was, was the Missouri way. And so I think from a marketing perspective, you know, advertising conferences, webinars, phone calls, it's not about the tactics. You know, you're, you're going to have to do all of those to have a good marketing mix. It's about what is the message that you're giving to your customer? What is that aha moment where you walk away, you say, wow, I saw something that can really impact my business. And I think that having a crisp aha moment that is the key to marketing. And for us, because our AI actually works, we asked everybody, send us a contract. Let's, let's, let's do the Missouri way. I love, I love that story as well as the concept. You have to give them an aha moment where they see it work. Uh, you have to be ready and it actually has to work, obviously. Otherwise, you, you got other problems you have to, to work on. Now, as, uh, last question here for you to wrap up. Um, as a business leader, are there any books that you've read or are reading or podcasts or audiobooks that you can recommend? There's a book I've read in my senior entrepreneurship class at USC um, that, that was called The Monk and the Riddle. And it's, a, it's an interesting book because it's written by an author uh, who was one of the earlier lawyers uh, for Apple and was was a lawyer that saw so many big tech companies uh, come through the Bay Area, then eventually started his own businesses and uh, also became an investor. And I think there was one part of the book that I just want to encourage everyone to think about. And I'll, I'll summarize it here. He said, as a young lawyer, I walked into my office and there was a long hallway. And the, the young associates, the first year associates, sat closest to the elevator because the elevator dinged and you, you get bothered by it. And then there was the middle level associates. And at the, at the very end of the hallway, there was the people who owned the law firm, the senior partners. And they'll walk in every day. They'll walk by all the first years and the middle levels and they'll feel a sense of pride. I used to be a first year. I used to be a middle level. My office is at the end of the corridor now. You know, I've made it. And the author then says, that's when I knew I wanted to quit a law firm. Because if you can see your entire life unfold in front of you in a hallway, your life is pretty predictable. I'm not saying that I don't like law firms or consulting firms or banks or any places of hallways. We have hallways. <clears throat> it's, it's more the metaphor, right? It's more the metaphor of, maybe it's because I'm a millennial, but it's more the metaphor of if I work hard I want to have an exciting life that's maybe not predictable, maybe high mountains and high peaks and low valleys. But if I work hard and I just walk down a hallway, then for me, I'd rather do something else. And, and that's what started the company for me. That is quite an impactful story to, to end on. It's like, what, where, where is your life headed? And can you have a, a sense of adventure? and who knows what, what will come next. Well, I'm excited for what does come next for you, Jerry. I know you have a, a glimpse of it, but who knows, right, as you continue to develop and uh, where AI goes. For those that want to learn more about Evisort, listen to part one of our interview. Go to uptechreport.com to, to get that episode, or you can go to evisort.com and be able to get a demo there. Thanks again, Jerry, for your time. This was awesome. Yeah, thanks, Alex. We'll see you guys on the next episode of Uptech Report. Have you seen a company using AI, machine learning, or other technology to transform the way we live, work, and do business? Go to uptechreport.com and let us know.